My name is Daniel Tward. I'm a faculty here in computational medicine and neurology as part of the Brain Mapping Center. Um, today, I want to talk about statistical analysis in my field of neuroimaging. And we were asked to present either a tutorial or a research talk, and I decided to do both, about 50-50. Um, and what I hope to do is, you know, a lot of people in the audience introduce themselves as statisticians or people who do statistics. I'm interested in seeing what kind of overlap there is, if any, between the techniques people use in genetics and the techniques people use in neuroimaging to solve similar types of problems. So at the end of the talk, um, please feel free to sit, chime in and say, well, I already know the answer to your problem, or say, this would be useful for my problem, something like that. Um, so let me get started with my goal. I'll tell you a little bit about the work I do and why I do it. So many different diseases impact the brain's structure and function. And for all these different diseases, oftentimes the symptoms overlap. For example, a symptom of dementia just means your cognition is not working properly. But it can have a lot of different causes, and each cause would have a different treatment. So rather than relying on symptoms like, like uh, dementia, we can identify abnormalities in the brain's function or structure using neuroimaging data. And my lab focuses on learning about health and disease from such neuroimaging data, which is fundamentally a statistical problem. And so there's two concepts I want to go over today. In the first, we'll review a standard method for statistical testing in brain imaging. I'll share some software on Google Colab that you can use to simulate images and simulate statistical tests if you want. And in the second part of the talk, I'll go over some new methods that we've developed, which we presented at Organization for Human Brain Mapping this year that might be able to improve this process in certain contexts. There's a gray square here. If anybody, I don't see a gray square in front of me. So if something critical disappears behind the gray square, you can wave at me or something like that, and I'll, I'll explain it or slide the window around. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about brains, because not everybody here does work in neuroscience, although some of you do. Um, the brain consists of many, many neurons, as well as some other cells, and at the top left here is a picture of a neuron, which was drawn by Ramoni Cajal who was the first Spanish-speaking person to win a Nobel Prize for work related to this. Now, neurons consist of two main parts. They have cell bodies, which you can see on the left here. This is where the nucleus and all the cellular machinery is located. And then they have these long projections which connect one cell to another. And these cells can do computations by connecting to one another in a non-linear fashion. Now, the cell bodies are generally called gray matter. And the connections, these long processes between the cells, are called white matter. And in clinical MRI, uh, the most common type of MRI is called T1-weighted MRI. It's easy to remember because gray matter looks gray and white matter looks white. So on the lower right-hand side, you can see an example of an MRI of a brain image. And if you zoom in, you can see white matter, which is connections between different cell bodies, and gray matter, which is where the cell bodies are located. So why is the brain interesting and challenging to study? Well, one reason is that the phenomena that goes on in the brain crosses orders of magnitude in spatial scale and measures multiple different properties of the brain. So on the left side here is just an example where you can see synapses in the brain stained in green fluorescence. These are where one neuron connects to another to talk. And in purple fluorescence, you can see one of these processes of a neuron, an axon. So just to give you a sense of how many connections there are in the brain, it's really space filling. If you look at all these green dots, most of the brain, at least uh, in gray matter, is full of these connections. It's very dense. If we start zooming out to the scale of whole cells, you can see here around the scale of 10 microns, we have individual neurons. And this is a microscopy image of someone's brain who died of Alzheimer's disease. And these brown cell bodies here are called tau tangles. These are cells which accumulated a misfolded protein and died, which is um, one of the symptoms and or causes of Alzheimer's disease. And then on the right-hand side here, we can keep zooming out. 
and learn about brain anatomy at the one millimeter scale. And so there's lots of information we can measure about brain anatomy. On the right-hand side, we're looking at uh, how quickly water diffuses in the brain. And on the left-hand side, we're looking at what direction water diffuses in the brain. So we can see some interesting features. Blue means water is diffusing up and down, and that's highlighting the corticospinal tract. So that's where your motor cortex projects down your spine to control muscles. Another reason why the brain is difficult and interesting to study is because it has a very complex geometry. So if you look on the left side here, we see the cortical surface of the brain. And on the right hand side, we see a family of deep gray matter structures where a lot of cell bodies look, uh, are located. And these are very, very weird shapes. So on the left hand side, it's very difficult to describe a shape like this. Most people call it brain shape. If they see other things in nature that look like this, they give it names like brain coral, things like that. So because there's so much variability in this shape from one person to another, it becomes a challenge to study all of these anatomical structures. But fortunately, a lot of work has been done in these two areas. And people have developed what's known as brain atlases. And these are standard images, like you see on the bottom a standard brain image where all the structures in their brain, including their very complex shapes, have been annotated across multiple spatial scales from very coarse resolution, which you can see on the left, to very fine resolution, which you can see on the right. Now at the coarsest scale, in green we're just highlighting brain, and in not green we're highlighting not brain, so that's very coarse. But as we start getting to a finer and finer spatial scale, we identify the lobes of the brain, the gray matter, white matter, boundaries, and eventually every single anatomical structure which has a functionally uh, distinct purpose. So this linking of structures across spatial scales is called an ontology. And the ontology tells us something about how the brain is organized. And in a few minutes, we'll get to how I'd like to use these ontologies to do statistical testing on brain images in a better way. Now, by identifying patterns of signals associated with specific disease, what we'd like to be able to do is discriminate between diseases that have similar symptoms. So for example, all these brain images on the right are from people with different types of dementing illnesses. But if we measure atrophy in the brain, so blue and red is showing an atrophy signal, tissue loss, and study, thank you. Uh, let's try this. Okay, so blue is showing areas that are atrophying, red is showing areas that are larger than average. And by studying the spatial patterns of these signals, we can discriminate between different diseases, oftentimes even before symptoms um, appear. So in the top row here, we see atrophy in the temporal lobe, which is characteristic of Alzheimer's disease atrophy in these cortical areas on the left side of the brain, it's the right side of the image, but radiologists like to be backward, is a characteristic of primary progressive aphasia. Huntington's disease shows changes in the deep basal ganglia structures, and hereditary ataxia shows changes in the cerebellum. So if we can identify statistically these types of spatial patterns, we know where to go looking in a patient's brain image to try to figure out what problems they may have before bad symptoms start to develop. So I wanted to walk through how a statistical neuroimaging study is performed. The first thing we do is acquire imaging data. So we acquire n not images of control images of control individuals, which you can see in the top row. We acquire n1 images of diseased individuals, which you can see on the bottom row. Then we want to compute some signal of interest. So this may be some computation we do on these gray and white matter images, or it may be an additional signal we measure like functional MRI, what areas of the brain are active during certain tasks, or structural MRI, how is water diffusing through the brain in different orientations. So what I'm just showing here is some signal superimposed on top of the brain images in red. 
And where the signal is bright, I show it as opaque. Where the signal is dim, I show it as transparent, just so you can see where the signal lies on top of the different brain structures. Now, the next step we do, step three, is choose a fixed coordinate system. So we take all these brain images, which are different sizes and different shapes. The people are lying in the scanner in slightly different poses. And we line them up using various image registration techniques so that the same pixel corresponds to the same brain region in every single person. And in a 3D image, a pixel is called a voxel, which stands for volume element. Once we've got all our data aligned to a standard coordinate system, we can compute a test statistic at every single pixel in the image. So if we measure a signal called SIJ at voxel I in subject J, and we have some model G is equal to 1 if the subject is diseased, and G is healthy if the subject is, sorry, G is 0 if the subject is healthy, we can build a linear model at every single pixel. This is an example of a linear model. At pixel I for subject J, we have some mean, a, which is an unknown parameter, and some shift, which we attribute to disease for the individuals who are diseased, and some independent Gaussian white noise. So here, A and B are parameters we would estimate. G is uh, part of our study design, and S is the signal we measure. So as an example, we can build a T statistic at every single voxel to test the null hypothesis that B equals 0. So if B equals zero here, then there is no difference between healthy and control, uh, healthy and diseased individuals. If B is not zero at some of the voxels, we look for which voxels it's not zero, and we use that to identify a spatial pattern, which we can apply to diagnosing individuals in the future. So at the bottom row, we can see the mean of the controls in this data set, the mean of the diseased individuals, a common standard deviation, and then we look at a signal-to-noise ratio to build a test statistic. And you can see in the medial temporal lobe here, you have a bright red signal. And that's because these individuals are um, simulated to represent some abnormalities due to Alzheimer's disease, which affects the medial temporal lobe. So the last thing we want to do after we've computed this test statistic, is convert the test statistics to p-values. So the simplest thing we could do is just look up uh, the CDF of a t-statistic at every voxel, look at the p-value, and see where the p-values look small or less than 0.05. So you can see an example here. The color bar means very small p-values are in red, and bigger p-values are in gray. And so here we can see we were able to identify some changes in the hippocampus because they have small p-values, less than 0.05. So this is the basic design of a statistical study in neuroimaging. But there are problems with what I just told you. So the first major problem that probably everyone who studies genetics is familiar with is with 10 million voxels in a brain image, choosing a threshold of p less than 0.05 is going to lead to many, many false positives. So this is not a good way to identify spatial patterns in our data. We need a better way to control error rates. And the second thing that's interesting here is the claim that I made was we saw a signal in the hippocampus. So if we want to make a claim about which anatomical structures have signal differences in them, why do we need to do statistical testing independently 10 million times at every single voxel? There should be some way to do statistical testing at various levels from coarse to fine in our ontology in order to make more useful claims and also to make claims even when we don't have enough statistical power to reject a null hypothesis at every single voxel. So I'm going to begin by talking about the first aspect of this problem, the false positive rate. And in neuroimaging, there was a great study which was done as a joke to illustrate this problem um, based on a dead salmon. So you can see this poster on the left-hand side that somebody presented at an important meeting where they did a typical fMRI study um, 
They took a participant, put them in an fMRI scanner, they showed them faces of people experiencing different emotions, and then they evaluated which regions in the brain showed statistical differences when the salmon was observing these pictures versus when they were just relaxing. And so if you look, the subject here of the study is one mature Atlantic salmon, Salmo salar, participated in the fMRI study. The salmon was approximately 18 inches long, weighed 3.8 pounds, and was not alive at the time of scanning. So this is an example of doing the same analysis that I just described to you. They found some voxels here with low p-values, and therefore they can conclude that this is the region of the salmon which responds to uh, images of people making different uh, facial expressions. So this is really just a silly example, but uh, this problem is kind of fundamental to the reproducibility crisis, which has really been uh, important in the fMRI community. A lot of people are doing statistical analysis incorrectly, getting more false positives than they expect, and leading to problems that are not as obvious as this one, but still fail to be reproduced by other groups. Fortunately, the field of statistics has more or less solved this problem, or at least provided us with a bunch of different tools we can use to approach this problem. One type of method for controlling error rates is called false discovery rate correction. And what this does is a user will specify an expected proportion of false positives relative to all of the false positives and true positives. And we might choose a threshold of 0.05. So we'll say every voxel that I say has an effect, 5% of those I could be wrong. This method is a little bit less conservative than the alternative that I'll be talking about, family-wise error rate. In family-wise error rate, what we'd like to do is control the probability that there's even one false positive. So among the 10 million voxels in the image, if even one of those is a false positive, I'm going to feel bad, and I'm not going to be able to do reproducible science. So I'd like to control that rate and say there's less than a 5% chance that even one voxel shows a false positive. Now, some people argue that FWR is a little too conservative, but it relies on some, it relies on very, very few assumptions, whereas FDR relies on more assumptions that are sometimes difficult to verify. Um, and as an example, we can control the family-wise error rate using something called the Bonferroni correction. And that just says, if I have n voxels in my image, n equals 10 million, Instead of thresholding my p-values at 0.05, we'll threshold them at 0.05 divided by 10 million. So this is a very simple method. It always controls the FWER, but it's very conservative, especially if I have 10 million voxels. This is going to be a threshold so small that I could never afford to scan enough people to find any statistical effect. So there's better methods than the Bonferroni correction, which I'd like to talk about quickly before we move on um, to some of, uh, some of my research component of the talk. So an important observation is we can control the family-wise error rate for any data set by looking at the distribution of the maximum statistics. So we compute a statistic at every voxel in the image. We have n test statistics, ti. And in some subset of those voxels, the null hypothesis is actually true. We'll call this subset capital I. And we'll perform an experiment by saying we'll choose a single threshold, lowercase t. We'll compare all of our voxels to that threshold. And we'll decide if we reject our null hypothesis. So the question is, how do we find this threshold t um, so that we can control the family-wise error rate? So let's just look at the definition. The family-wise error rate is the probability of one or more false positives. And that means it's the probability that there is some voxel in our set of voxels where the null hypothesis is true, where the test statistic exceeds some threshold. Now, if it's true for some voxel, it means it's definitely true for the biggest one. So we can replace this there exists with a maximum over this set. This is where the maximum statistic comes into play. Now, unfortunately, in practice, we, we do not know this set i. We don't know where the null hypothesis is true. If we did, we wouldn't be doing this experiment in the first place. So we'd like to expand 
um, this calculation over an unknown subset to a calculation over all the voxels. And in order to do this, we need to change what we condition on. We're going to expand this set from uh, only the voxels where the null hypothesis is true to all the voxels. And this relates on an assumption about our data. This assumption is called subset pivotality. And generally, it's true in imaging because there's no constraint between where the null hypothesis might be true. But if we're looking at other types of data, in particular correlation matrices, there might be constraints, like a correlation matrix must be positive definite. If we reject the null hypothesis for one element, we may have to reject it for a different element. So in imaging, this is a, a reasonably, um, this is a reasonable assumption. But it's not an assumption that applies in every single context. So once we've done this, we can expand the maximum over the unknown subset to the maximum over all voxels. And what we see is, in order to control family-wise error rate, we just need to look at the maximum statistic over all the voxels and compute the probability that it's greater than some threshold little t. So the goal is, if we know this distribution, which is 1 minus the CDF of the maximum statistic, we can identify that T by using the inverse of the CDF. And we can use that TV, T to threshold all the voxels in our image and control family-wise error rate. OK, so if U is our maximum statistic and F uh, subscript U is its cumulative distribution function, CDF, then we know the family-wise error rate is less than or equal to 1 minus Fu of t. So if we can calculate this CDF, the distribution of our maximum statistic, we can control the error rate. Now in practice, it's very, very difficult, other than in trivial cases, to compute this distribution. So we rely on resampling methods like permutation testing to do it. Now, the idea of permutation testing is to approximate this distribution by considering something called exchangeability. Instead of testing the null hypothesis that b equals 0 at every voxel, we'll test a weaker hypothesis that our data is exchangeable at this voxel. What that means is if we permute all the group labels, then the test statistic won't change. This is weaker because it's implied by bi equals 0. Since bi equals 0 implies exchangeability, then by applying a contrapositive from logic, we can say not exchangeability implies not bi equals 0. So if we can reject the exchangeability hypothesis, we can also reject the null hypothesis that we are interested in. Now this reference at the bottom is a very nice review of how these permutation-based methods are used in neuroimaging. But the basic idea is that if exchangeability is true, then every time we permute the group labels, we produce a sample which is equally likely. So if we uniformly sample over permutations, we can build a distribution of this test statistic, compute its 95th percentile, and compare that threshold to all our data. Then we can control family-wise error rate. And hopefully, we won't uh, find any voxels in the dead salmon where we see its brain responding to pictures of faces. So on the bottom is an example of a histogram where the histogram shows the values of the permuted maximum statistic. The green line here shows the 95th percentile that we want to use as our threshold. And the orange line shows the maximum of our actual data set. So since the orange line here is to the left of the green line, we shouldn't reject any voxels. So if we back up to the picture I showed you where I said, look, there's a signal in the hippocampus, that's actually not true for this data set. We were looking at, uh, we, we do not have any evidence that what we were looking at wasn't random noise. Now, this hypothesis of exchangeability is pretty simple in the example that I showed you, but in other cases where there might be dependence between uh, individuals in your study, they might be siblings, they might be twins, exchangeability is difficult to articulate exactly when it should hold and when it should not hold. And there's two basic 
uh, rules in the literature that people have been doing for accounting for this. So in one case, instead of permuting group labels, we can permute residuals. So we believe that after you have fitted to a model, if the null hypothesis is true, the residuals are now independent of one another and we can permute them. Another approach is to permute data in blocks. All we need is some family of transformations to apply to our data where exchangeability holds. We don't have to permute everything. And there's a lot of interesting uh, tools that have been developed for building diagrams to show in what conditions exchangeability holds and in what it, cases it doesn't hold and tells you how you can do permutation in blocks to account for these differences. So this reference here, uh, Anderson Winkler gives a very nice explanation of this problem. Um, builds some very nice diagrams that are relatively easy to interpret and provides some tools for computing permutations in blocks. Now, I just wanted to walk quickly through an example. We don't have that much time left, but for anyone who is interested, you can click on this link here or scan the QR code, which I haven't tested this QR code, but a tiny URL tells me it will take you to the link. And we'll see something like this. So you can make a copy of this notebook, and it includes um, a tool for visualizing brain atlases. So these are annotations that tells us what structure in the brain is shown here. So we had a, a talk earlier this week where people tried to predict these types of annotations from brain images. But given the annotations, we can synthesize brain images where we say, well, white matter structures are white, gray matter structures are gray, there's some noise and there's some blur. So this provides a very simple tool for synthesizing brain images synthesizing fMRI signals, visualizing them, building some data. So here's a data set with 10 samples, computing an F statistic at every voxel as opposed to a T statistic, and performing permutation testing. So here, if we do permutation testing a thousand times, we see that the orange line, our true statistic from our data is bigger than the 95th percentile of our permuted data. Therefore, we can reject null hypotheses in some regions of the brain. And in this case, we see the left hippocampus, but not the right, has a strong enough signal to be able to reject the null hypothesis here while still controlling family-wise error rate. So please feel free to use this notebook if it's something that you are interested in playing with. Uh, the Atlas Brain comes from a website called mricloud.org, which was developed by me and some of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins five or so years ago before I moved here. Um, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit now and return to the two problems I described with our analysis. The first problem I said was, if there's so many voxels, how are we going to account for false positives? So there's a, a lot of literature and a very well-developed framework to account for that. The second problem is, if we're interested in making claims about the hippocampus, why do we need to control error rates at every voxel? So myself and my student, Paige Lee, um, who recently left to go to Harvard for a master's program, decided to work on building a statistical testing framework where if we don't have enough statistical power to localize signal differences to any voxel, we can back up and say, well, maybe we can localize them to somewhere within one of these fine structures. And if we don't have enough power to localize them to a fine structure, maybe we can back up and localize them to a coarser structure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the coarsest structure. And backing all the way up to the coarsest structure is actually very common in statistical testing. It's usually called an omnibus test, where we say there is a difference somewhere, and we don't know where it is. You're going to have to do something to follow up to say to figure out where it is. So this is really just extending the idea of omnibus testings to multiple levels of an ontology where finer grain structures are nested within coarser grain structures. So what we did to achieve this is, first of all, simplify the problem a lot. So instead of a whole brain, like I showed you, with 286 structures, here we're only going to look at three structures. We have a brain, 
and a hippocampus and an amygdala. So a hippocampus and amygdala are two structures in the medial temporal lobe that are important in Alzheimer's disease. Now this is a directed graph, and in fact it's a tree, and ontology is a tree. So I'll use the language parent and child, where parent means you're closer to the trunk of the tree, child means you're closer to the leaves of the tree. And then we also use forestry language to say that this element is the root of the tree, and these guys at the end are the leaves of the tree. So the goal here is can we demonstrate that we can build a model where we can reject a null hypothesis for brain, even when we don't have the statistical power to reject it for either hippocampus or amygdala. So the idea is if we can't localize a signal, do we have to throw out our study and say we failed to find our effect, or can we back up and make a claim which is a little bit less strong, but still potentially useful? So to do this, we'll first build a statistical model. We'll estimate parameters within that model and compute a test statistic based on the parameter values that we estimated. So in this model, we say every structure can be either affected by a disease or unaffected. For structure S, we'll say ZS equals one if it's affected. And if it's not effective, we'll say ZS equals zero. Now importantly, this variable z is something that we cannot observe. We only observe a signal at the voxels of the image or at the leaves of our tree. Now to specify this model, we say the root structure is affected with probability p root. This is a parameter we have to estimate. And we'll say if any parent is affected, its children could be affected with probability q, which is something we have to estimate. And if a parent is not affected, then none of its children are affected. So if we say your brain is not affected, that means definitely no compartments of your brain are affected. But if your brain is affected, then the hippocampus or the amygdala might be affected and might not. Now the last ingredient of this model is to say what data we actually observe. So we say for every leaf in this model, where a leaf could be voxels in an image or it could be some fine-grained structure, we say we observe some signal which has a PDF of F1 if it's affected, and it has a PDF, probability density function, of F0 if it's not affected. So given this model, we can start generating some data. It's a generative model. We can sample from it. So here, if we plug in a few parameters, P root equals 0.75, Q for hippocampus is 0.9. That's the probability that the hippocampus will be affected if the brain is affected. Q for amygdala is 0.1, so even if the brain is affected, it's unlikely the amygdala will be affected. And we'll say that the data we observe is just Gaussian distributed with mean 0 and variance 1 if there's no signal, and with mean 4 and variance 1 if there is a signal. So we can sample data like this. We initialize our z's and sample them as Bernoulli random variables. If a parent is affected, we sample children as Bernoulli random variables. So here, the brain was affected, the hippocampus was affected, and the amygdala is also affected. Now we look at all the leaf structures that are affected, and we can sample data from a Gaussian with mean 4 for the hippocampus and amygdala. And we can repeat this for a new sample. In our second sample, the amygdala was not affected, so we'll sample our observed data from a Gaussian with mean zero. We can repeat this process again and again and again, and eventually if we look at a scatter plot of our observed data, we see that there's a, a slightly complicated correlation structure in here. You can see a line here because it's they're correlated because their probability of being affected is governed by a shared parent. So there's a complicated signal here, and this type of modeling can actually reduce to the mass univariate approach that I described previously as a special case. So the mass univariate approach would be where there's no dependency between um, the signal at each voxel. So once we can generate model and observe it, once we can generate data under this model, or we can observe it from an experiment, we can now build an algorithm to estimate the unknown parameters. So since this random variable z, which structures are affected, is unobserved, we can apply the expectation maximization algorithm. The EM algorithm basically says, let's take the unobserved data and replace it 
with its expected value given your current guess of any parameters in this model. So here the parameters are Q and P, the probability that uh, the structures are affected given their parents. So in the expectation step, we can compute the expected value of these Zs, and there's some formulas here, um, which are not that important, merely the idea that these are recursive equations, where we start with the leaves and we work our way back up to the root. And then in the M step of this algorithm, after we plug in the expected value of our missing data, we can update any parameters. So we can update these P's and Q's, and if there happen to be any unknown parameters in the distribution of our data, we could update them as well. Now, this is an iterative process that we carry out 100 times or so in order to estimate the unknown parameters. Now what's nice about this model, other than the fact that it's hierarchical, is the fact that we can compute the probability that every structure is affected and use that as a test statistic. So this is a, it's not a usual test statistic, it's not like a T statistic or an F statistic, but it's very interpretable. We know if the number is close to one, we know that that means it's likely this part of your brain was affected. If it's close to zero, it means it's likely it's not affected. So we can interpret this test statistic. And it also has a nice property, which is that P for parents is always going to be greater than the P for children. Because of that, we can use a step-down method for statistical testing, where we sort all our data from biggest to smallest and apply permutation testing from biggest to smallest. If we follow this procedure, we'll never end up with an illogical result that says a child was rejected unless its parent was also rejected. Um, and to do this, we build upon uh, a method, a general method for permutation testing by uh, Joseph Romano and Michael Wolf. Now, this is a copy of the poster that we presented at the Organization for Human Brain Mapping this summer. The basic idea is we carried out a simulation study and we showed that 20% of the time we were able to reject a null hypothesis at a coarse level even if we failed to reject it at a finer level. So this approach gives researchers a statistical tool to kind of refine the claims that they're making if they didn't have a statistical if they did not have statistical power to reject null hypotheses at single voxels, they might still be able to reject them at larger and larger structures in the brain. Okay, let me just review briefly. Statistical testing is critical for identifying spatial patterns in the brain that may be associated with different types of diseases. When we're testing statistics at every voxel in a brain image, multiple testing issues are problematic, but there's a whole field of literature describing how we can use permutation testing to control family-wise error rate and uh, avoid participating in the reproducibility crisis. And in my work, we're designing some novel methods for doing statistical testing in hierarchy from fine to coarse, hopefully to give researchers a new tool that will allow them to be more flexible about where and how they can reject null hypotheses about their data. So oh, thanks very much for your attention. Um, I think I went a little over time and everyone's getting tired, but if there's any comments or questions, um, please feel free to ask. Thank you.